Hello everybody and welcome to The Secret History Living in Your Aquariums. I'm Alexander Williamson. I will be your host of today's video and uh, the creator of this channel. I'll be him too. So today we're going to be talking about sex and gender in fish. Now I wanted to make this video so that anybody curious about this topic can come back and refer to this video if we're talking about it in a future video and I say, oh, I've already got a video on that, then I can pin it in the comments and whatnot. So that's why this is being made. But what is the difference between sex and gender? So strictly biologically speaking, going with the science of the modern era and not with uh, any personal opinions or any political opinions, any controversy type stuff like that, um, there isn't anything controversial about sex. Sex is a physical definition of how a body is assembled, and it goes down to your genetics. So you have an X and a Y chromosome that are your reproductive uh, chromosomes or, or gametes that are related to your sex, and in humans, it's usually that you're XX and a female, or XY and a male. However, there is a third option, and fourth, and fifth, and actually kind of infinite in the mutations that can happen. However, it gets exceedingly rare. But in fish, that's not the case. Fish are able to actually change their biological ability to reproduce. So when talking about sex in fish, we actually have to kind of reassess our definitions because in humans, we assume that you're, you can express physically differently than your chromosomes would lead people to believe. So you, you can be born a, a percentage somewhere between 0.01% and 0.5%, depending on the studies you read, and the part of the world that you're looking at, the genetic uh, makeup of the group, uh, is born, as we call intersex, which is when you have XXY as a chromosome configuration. Or there's the other option, which is often not included in the, in the discussion, but it's important when we talk about ornamental fish, which is chimerism, which is when basically two organisms fused as one, for lack of wanting to go into all the detail, two different organisms fuse into one. Now, they can happen to be different, uh, they can happen to be different sexes, and we'll get to gender in a moment, but they can happen to be different sexes. So you can have a human or a houseplant, uh, for instance, Anubias, when the leaves are half white and half uh, green, that's usually a form of chimerism. And it means that there is a genetic uh, difference in half the plant. And in humans, you may have seen like a CSI episode or something like that, where actually humans sometimes have different DNA for, for instance, their hair than their skin. So when they do a DNA sequence, they'll find that they actually have some form of chimerism. Now, that could be two males, and then that would be not an issue with sex. But when it's two different sexes, that could be also classified as intersex, as we call it. So in humans, which is not a good analog to refer to fish for, because humans are not going to be able to be uh, biologically fertile if they're in the intersex category generally. Uh, there's a sim the syndrome when you have XXY chromosomes, it's called Klinefelter syndrome, and you can actually have XXXY, or you can have YYXX. I mean, there's lots of different permutations you can have. Now, in fish, we found that there's fish and reptiles, too, that some of them have six different chromosomes that are somewhat linked to their sex. So it can be very, very different in fish. They've evolved a lot of different strategies. Now, here comes the sticky part or the tricky part 
and that is going to be talking about gender. Now, I don't want anybody raging in the comments about their opinions on this, but there are infinite genders. Why is that? That doesn't make sense. You know, there's only male and female uh, biologically. Well, we just talked about that. There isn't. There are more options than male and female. There's intersex, there's chimerism, there are chromosomal anomalies. And when we talk about fish that have been bred line breeding wise where they're crossed with their own siblings and their parents back over generations and generations for physical traits some of these weird symptom symptoms and syndromes that would normally be very very rare in the wild become more and more common so for instance it was found out in the 1970s in research that domesticated betta splendens can change their their sex and their gender now, when I say they change their sex, that means that they're literally a female that had fertile eggs, that had babies, and it becomes a male, or vice versa. That would be changing sex. Now, if it's a gender change, this is where it gets a little more convoluted and where it's more of an opinionated thing. So gender is how a culture interprets the expression of a uh, behavioral and physical appearance and uh, the things you do, the way you interact uh, within your culture. Now, you could say fish don't have a culture, but I would argue that fish do have behavioral norms and set motifs in which they use for reproduction. And some fish, for instance, uh, sheep's head fish, they're able to sequentially change their gender and their sex. So when I say they're changing their gender, I mean, yes, they're changing their ability to reproduce as a male or a female, that's changing sex, but the gender is the traits associated and cues associated that tells the other fish around them, hey, that is a male or female, I am the opposite so I can reproduce with them. Now. There's also the option, uh, speaking of plants and fungi and things, of clones. So where you cut off a piece and it is self-replicating. Snails and things also have the ability sometimes to do even more diverse things. And so there is, for instance, in fish, the Amazon molly. And the Amazon molly is incredible in that there are only females of the species. And the females can only reproduce with a different species. So the females need to find some sort of other sword tail or molly or guppy to fertilize them because they're all female. Then that sparks them to have a egg that is fertile, but it's not fertilized with the genetic material of the other species. So what's born? another female clone, essentially, of that female. And crayfish can do this too. And we can get into that and all the terminology for that in another video, but I don't want to lay all that on you. So when we're talking about gender in fish, what's important to know is it's how they're presenting. And so if you have a guppy, for instance, and male guppies usually are the ones that have color, you would say that's the common uh, thing that happens is the male has color and they do a little shimmy shake. There's certain behaviors that we see and we say, yep, that's a male guppy. Uh, that is the male gendered guppy. Well, then there's another reproductive strategy that say 20% or 10% of male guppies use, which is they don't color up. They actually have finages and even behavior that would mimic a female and they will try to uh, hide. And what they'll do is they'll lay low so that they're not in competition with the other males. And then they'll reproduce with, with the females at the last moment while the big uh, flashy males that have all the color that is your quote unquote typical male is busy sparring with other males. They'll sneak in and they'll have babies with the female. So you could argue that that is a third gender within guppies. You could also say that 
when they are uh, born and we are modifying them through line breeding and the females have all sorts of beautiful colors in their tail and on their body, that's not how they look in the wild. So you could argue that the gender is different. The sex is still female, but you could argue that the gender of that female is expressing male stereotypes in that she has pigmentation. It's essentially like if she had a beard and mustache and we've line bred them selectively for that. So gender, while it is a cultural thing and the more complex a culture is, the more permutations of that there are, it's also in fish going to usually be linked to their biological makeup. But I wanna make it clear that those are separate things. So there are fish that are also uh, male fish that will try to, uh, they'll try their darndest to reproduce with other male fish. And in guppies, we'll stick with guppies here, they actually show off to the females as a more fit uh, fish. So the females that see two male guppies uh, simulating how a male and female guppy would reproduce, when they see that mating dance and the exchange going on with the nether regions of the fish, the cloaca and the gonopodium and all that, they actually have a higher fertility. So in 2015, a paper showed that the male guppies that actually engage with other male guppies in front of females get to mate with more females. So unlike human society where that may be a, uh, seen as linked to gender heavily, their choice in sexuality and how they're interacting and reproducing has nothing to do with their gender necessarily. Gender is that independent identity of that. And so I just wanted to make this video to make that clear because in the fish world, there are so many different variations, especially with what we've done crossing them and, and getting them to be different than they would be in the wild. So for instance, domesticated bettas also, they change their actual sex. And that can be a change that occurs in epigenetics. And the way to think about epigenetics that I like to say best is, it's almost like you've got your genetic code and that stays the same your, your whole life, give or take some mutations that can occur over time to your uh, genetic code due to copying errors or due to radiation and other things like that. But for the most part, your DNA stays the same. It's you know how we track people down forensically and things. So just as a chimera has two sets of DNA, you have a set of DNA that stays the same as a, uh, we'll say as the more common type of individual has one set of DNA. Well, fish, just like humans, also have an epigenetic code. So that overlays over your ingrained DNA and there are environmental triggers. So for instance, the pH or the, uh, the um, amount of heat, the temperature when a fish is being incubated or when a fish is a, an, in the egg stage, fish are not prescribed a gender when they are very young. All fish actually get cues from endogenous hormones within the fish world. So things like uh, t testosterone and estrogen send cues and the environment can change that. So you can have a 70% batch of males being born because the temperature was warmer in certain species. So all of these in my mind are useful categorizations of how to talk about fish because then we can talk about the very interesting ways in which fish reproduce. There's also fish that, you know, are not interested in reproducing. Some fish, as we would call it in humans, to, to, to try to draw a parallel, would have the asexual or just not interested in, in reproduction. And in humans, we would say that that is a cultural or gender choice, a behavioral choice and a uh, situa situational choice that occurs. But in fish, I would say gender is much easier because we get to, as humans, decide what that gender is. But what do you call it when it's a fish that's had its epigenetics? So just like 
it, it was once had a set of DNA, the temperature changes, for instance, or there's all males around one female, and suddenly, um, you know, one of the other males, a switch flips in its DNA, and there's a part of it that allows it to become a fertile female with eggs. So what do you call that gender? So that's where it would come in handy to categorize that fish's journey through life as have being one sex its whole life that was unique from male or female. It was intersex or it, it was a sequential hermaphrodite is the scientific term. And then it, it changes. Well, just like humans go through puberty at a certain age, fish can go through even more radical changes and change their actual structural sexual reproductive strategy. And so that is sex, whereas their colors, their behavior, their interest in the opposite gender or the same gender or not is all part of what we would consider gender in fish. And this is why people say there are endless genders. It is something completely separate from sex. And that is where a lot of arguments get tangled up for humans too. So you can argue, depending on the culture, that there may only be two in certain, you know, beliefs, uh, a male and a female, but even biologically, there are more than that. There's XXY, there's XXX. There are more options than that. So it stands to reason that there are more genders than that. But you could also argue that certain societies, we say, no, pick either male or female. You may be more, there may be more sexes than that, but you got to pick A or B. So I find it useful in fish to be able to say that there are five genders in guppies, for instance. There are the ones that don't want to reproduce and don't color up and don't spawn. There are the females that show themselves like the statistical average of females tends to, which is, you know, silver, not showing their not showing bright, colorful fins, and they want to reproduce with males. Then there's also males that just want to reproduce with the females and they show bright colors. That would be your statistical, more common male gender. And male or female are actually sexes. So we shouldn't really be saying that with gender. We should call it something else, like a dominant male or a, uh, we could, for all, for all that matters, we could call that gender of guppy a flamboyant male or a non-flamboyant male or a dominant male, whatever we want to call it. But remember, we're bringing human baggage in when we do that. But it is kind of useful when we talk about these reproductive systems and methods, especially in when you get into plants and fungi and other things in, in the biological uh, view, there are so many options out there. I mean, there's frogs with six chromosomes that are related to their gender. The chromosome having to do with being male or female is not even linked to the X or Y chromosome in fish. In fact, that gene, the, uh, the GMRT1 gene, I believe it's called, it can change and it can move. And so in bettas, because of the inbreeding that's gone on in betta splendens, that's why they can change their from male to female in midlife is because that gene associated with it is no longer linked to the hardwired X and Y chromosome, but it can hop from the X to the S chromosome, the gene that says, okay, now you're female. Not only that, it can have environmental factors that tell that gene to change midlife, which is wild. I mean, if you look at races or sheep's head or clownfish, so I just wanted to go over all this and cover some of the crazy options that are available. It's what makes science, the world, biology fascinating. And uh, just so we don't get any rage in the comments, let's just keep this talking about fish. If you need to draw a parallel like I did to humans, uh, let's not make any other inferences pretending that this has anything about what's going on in American society or cultural society at large. I'm just trying to come up with another useful term and way to describe the fascinating world of biology in fish. So thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.